job. Empower him with your words today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The turmoil in our society in the last several years has exposed something that we've gotten wrong. And by we, I mean the broadest context. Evangelical Christianity in America. It didn't start going wrong three years ago. Kind of the way a team will make it through the regular season, covering over a weakness by dominating with their strength. But in a playoff series that goes seven games, the other team will find it and exploit it, and that weakness will come to the surface and end up limiting the team from going forward. I think we've seen or we're seeing in real time that happen in Jesus Church in America. We've gotten something badly wrong. Do you remember the Hans Christian Andersen children's fable, The Emperor's New Clothes? Like so many of his stories written for children, but darkly referential and weighty for us adults as a commentary on our ways. Perhaps it was because they were benefiting from the falsehood that the advisors to the emperor didn't speak up about the obvious truth. Maybe it was out of fear of reprisal, but for whatever reason, this institutionalized falsehood was allowed to go on until, of course, it wasn't. Does it sadden you? like it saddens me, that the narrative in our 96% non-church attending city concerning Jesus and his people is mostly not, oh, Jesus wasn't real, or I don't respect who he was, but rather, yeah, Jesus is great. It's his followers I don't want anything to do with. We chuckle when we say it. Does it trouble you like it troubles me? How deeply true that is in the experience of the people who are sleeping or having brunch or considering what we purport to order our lives around to be a fairy tale. Does it trouble you like it troubles me? That people consider themselves spiritual all the more when they go through difficult times. That they want truth. They search for God. But church is the last place they'd go to look for it because this disparity that they've experienced between who Jesus is and what his word holds out as good, true, and right for people and what is lived out in his name. Like the emperor's new clothes, we've participated in this falsehood. We've accepted this disparity between what Jesus said and what we accept Christian living is. This vast chasm. Why? Because perhaps we benefit from it. Perhaps we fear reprisal and being the only one to stand up or speak out against it. Perhaps... We're not sure if we're willing to bear the cost of what it asks in actuality. Does it trouble you like it troubles me? When we lose our way, it seems wise to go back to an established waypoint and reorient from there. Jesus, when he left his time on the earth gave us some standing orders, a set of instructions known in church culture as the Great Commission, normally read on Missions Sunday. In Matthew 28, the scripture records that Jesus came to his disciples just before he ascended to be with the Father and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples 
of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And while this is a set of unmistakable standing orders for Jesus' followers who would go on to constitute his church, it seems that we have been perhaps missing the main point of the instructions by relegating the meaning of this so-called Great Commission mostly to global missions. Because he says, go to the nations, we immediately think United Nations, flags of other countries, geopolitical nation states, and understandably the way our culture interprets that word, but to every one of Jesus' hearers, and I'll save the time and not, and just ask you to trust me or we'll study it later, the word that Jesus used in their common language, which was Greek, would have been understood by all of his hearers to refer simply to the different groupings of people, much more like what Pam was just saying. We're going to a different nation a mile and a half down the road in a government-subsidized housing community called Lincoln Park. Nations simply denoted groupings of people, perhaps by their ethno-linguistic traditions or cultures. There wasn't much of a grid for the other side of the world. We've made the Great Commission about going to the nations and thought, for most of us, we do our part when we support the church and the missionaries that it partners with. And we're grateful for those making disciples of nations that are indeed in other countries around the world. But I think maybe we've missed the point, and I think maybe we've missed the point on purpose. What if the weight of that saying, those standing orders, those prescient final words of our Savior wasn't go to the nations, so clap and cheer on Mission Sunday? What if the weight of what Jesus said was go and make disciples? Not so much go and make converts, go and make adherence to a set of beliefs, go and make churches or church attendees. As we say often, Jesus told them, I will build my church. It's very important to me. You build disciples. What if the point was discipleship in every context? I think this misunderstanding collectively in American Christianity has led us to believe that we're good. The charge isn't for us, it's for them. We're supposed to make disciples out of them over there. We are disciples because we identify as Christian. What if right out of the middle of these standing orders, we have extracted and removed the meat of the message what if we have turned these instructions of Jesus, in effect, into the great omission? And that's our title for this morning as we begin a new series. We're looking not just at what Jesus asked of us individually, but what Jesus asks of us as a community. And how having perhaps lost our way, we can be one family within its heartbreaking needs. It's whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians will become disciples. The greatest issue facing our world today such as it happens here in Christian America. Discipleship is mostly a euphemism for the option. The option for the Christian enthusiast, for the religious elite. 
sort of the way in culture we have come to understand there is the bulk of us who use technology and then there's the user plus crowd who put the Apple sticker in our car and identify with technology for some of our personality, ordering of our life, go to the technology conventions, wait in line to get the newest phones outside the Apple store. Do you have user plus crowd representatives in your neck of the woods? I was in the army to start my adult life and there was those that were in the army because we signed up or it paid for our college or it was an alternative to going to jail in our hometown when we got into trouble at 17. Whatever reason, we landed there and there was those of us who went to training and did the job and then there was the user plus crowd that like subscribed to Guns and Ammo magazine and had the super short haircut and wore their, their like Rockies baseball hat like a BDU cap forward on their head and identified with army culture. Do you have a user plus crowd in your ilk? You know, there's the people that, like almost all of us, live in Colorado because we enjoy the outdoors, and then there's the people that have seven or eight rack attachments, like for every life-saving scenario. You know, they have like the backboard in case somebody happens to fracture his spine while hiking. You can strap them on it while waiting for the life flight. They have the traction boards and, uh, and the long one that, that um, has the fly rod and all the different attachments and all the stickers of the brands of the various rack attachments on their rear view mirror saying, this is my thing. That's kind of, do you know what I'm talking about? I feel like I keep giving examples because I don't feel like you know what I'm talking about, but I think you ought to. So can you talk back to me for just a moment and pretend you're in the Bible Belt? All right, you got it. Thank you. They're saving me from over-explaining. You know, there's, there's like dad's plane, and then there's man's plane, and then there's pastor's plane. Where we're like, they probably don't fully speak English, so I ought to give another illustration. So thank you for sparing me from pastor's plane. All right, so the user plus card. I kind of think we've done that with discipleship in the American church. We've made discipleship if it's not relegated to the missions realm and what we do in other countries like our team going to India. Discipleship is the upgrade option. It's the all-in subset. But we've somehow permitted a culture and accepted it that says it's a perfectly viable path to be a Christian all of our lives and never become a disciple. And I think the implications have been grave. That one degree difference down the road, 40 or 60 years of evangelicalism in America has led to this massive disparity between Jesus, his way, his ideals, his promise for human lives and the way people experience his followers. Does it grieve you like it grieves me? With Christians self-described so hateful in what we're against that the world around us can scarcely discern what it is we're for. If we're gonna go back and find a better way, it seems worth asking, What did Jesus mean? What would his hearers have understood his invitation to consist of when he said to become disciples? What did he ask of his own disciples? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus call his very first disciples, Peter and his brother Andrew. It says, as he was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw these two brothers, Simon, who later became known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And of course, if you've been around church or if you went to Sunday school, you've heard this many times before, almost invariably emphasizing the second 
half of Jesus' invitation. Become fishers of men. This is almost always used and taught in the context of evangelism. Is that relevant? Sure. Does it make sense? Of course. But again, I think we might have missed the meat of the message. Jesus' invitation to those who would go on to be described as his disciples was come, follow me. In John chapter 1, Jesus, leaving for Galilee, found Philip, who was later to become one of his disciples, and he said to him just the same, follow me. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus went on from there and saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth in the act of the despised tax collection that was the synonym for the worst of the worst in Jesus' name, in Jesus' day. Follow me. He told him. Jesus' own invitation lived out that to which his final instructions for us undoubtedly referred when he said, go and make disciples. He relied on their observing what that looked like, how he did it, what making disciples looked like when Jesus was making disciples. And what's Startlingly clear is that discipleship is not agreeing with him, promoting him, or invoking his name. Discipleship is following him. The great Dallas Willard went on to observe when Jesus walked among humankind. There was a certain simplicity to being his disciple. Primarily, it meant to go with him in an attitude of observation, study, obedience, and imitation. A disciple, he continued, is a learner, a student, an apprentice, a practitioner even if only a beginner. Disciples of Jesus are people who do not just profess certain views as their own, but apply their growing understanding of life in the kingdom to every aspect of their life on earth. The truth is, I think we've learned a distortion of this reality from our culture. And the implications have been grave. Anybody follow someone? Like on, you know, Instagram? We understand, I think, what we mean by that, but we follow Beyonce, liking her posts, promoting her products, increasing her fame and wealth. Heaven knows she needs it, so keep increasing that wealth. And we say we're her follower. But what do we really mean? Is there anything wrong with that? Not necessarily. But that's gone on, that phenomenon, to redefine the notion. We've learned to follow someone we don't know, to like their posts and consume their content and promote their stuff and think that's what the word means. And I think we do it for good reason. We get a little dopamine hit, the researchers have told us, every time we see a post of the minutia of their daily life and we feel connected to them. And then they, of course, get a little more influence from us, and so there's a sort of dressed up codependence that has emerged in this apocryphal followership, isn't there? We might call ourselves followers, but let's be honest what we really are is fans. It's fine. It's just not the same. 
And in this distorted way, we can follow dozens of people, hundreds even, without even one of them requiring us to change. And in a similar way, I have a question for you. Have you substituted being a follower of Jesus for being a fan? Instead of shepherding people to follow Jesus, it seems to me that Christian America has shepherded us towards subscribing to a Jesus subculture that elevates adherence to a set of beliefs, preference for traditional values, affiliation with a political agenda, and participation in religious activities over the long, slow work of discipleship. Does it grieve you like it grieves me? Instead of do not conform to the pattern of this world in Romans 12, we just end up conforming to a different pattern of this world. Go. Think of it this way. When I was a kid, okay, as an adult, I like the red candy's best. I'm that guy that like, goes through, I don't eat a ton of candy, and when I do, I want the ones I like. I don't like the artificial lime flavor. I like the artificial cherry flavor, so I eat all the red gummy bears out of the pack, and my kids are like, what the heck? Anyone else eat the red Skittles? Or the red Lifesavers for you old heads? All right, I like them because I like cherry. That's my flavor preference. Here's what occurred to me only well into middle age. Cherry, the lifesaver, is almost nothing to do with cherries. Right? Like, have you had a cherry Skittle? Yes or no? Have you had a cherry? They don't even pretend to taste the same. But what's funny about it is most Americans, I would wager, identify cherry flavor with the Skittle more than the fruit. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, other than red number four and poisoning yourself slowly over time, but if that's your thing, <laughs> I got no judgment. Here's my point. Somewhere early, perhaps before we were born, we were conditioned to like an artificially flavored Jesus product. Like, have you ever looked at the bottom of Tang? It says, contains 2% real juice. Like, what is the other 98%? We've been conditioned to prefer a flavor that contains, like, little bits of real Jesus in every crunchy bite. But is so different from the actual flavor of Jesus that we understand Jesus to be the artificially flavored product we've learned to crave and we don't recognize that that's not Jesus at all. Does it grieve you like it grieves me? As a result, there's emerged a sort of broad-scale religious codependence, kind of like following Beyonce. It works for individuals because it allows us to feel good about ourselves, to be a part of something without having to be transformed. And it works for leadership because it grows corporations. And it allows us to believe that we are doing something for Jesus when we bring in more people and more money.
It allows us to tell ourselves we're making Jesus famous when we're making ourselves famous and forgetting that Jesus didn't ask us to do either. And it grieves me. Luke chapter nine, and we'll wrap it up here. Jesus said to all of his followers, having called one, follow me and be my disciple. And another, follow me. And another, follow me. Jesus now had a crowd. And he said to the whole crowd, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Follow me is the singular invitation of the disciple. Not promote me, not agree with me, but deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And becoming a disciple is harder than becoming a fan or a convert or an attendee. It asks more of us. It asks us to die to ourselves. Deny themselves, he said, and take up their cross. And while that is a throwaway notion to us, to any resident of the Middle East in the first century AD, taking up your cross is a culture aphorism that means something particular and painful. As they've watched people carry their own cross through the public square, to their execution. We must die to ourselves and we might have to do it violently. And follow Jesus, different from liking him or agreeing with him or identifying with his movement. Because where that one degree of difference has landed with a vast chasm of separation a disparity between who even the onlooking world understands Jesus to be and what he hears them promise and then what they see him have made. In that chasm, in that disparity, lives this harrowing truth. Forgiveness is free, that's true following is costly. Forgiveness is free, but following, it'll cost you your life. The invitation from Jesus was clear, to leave behind their lives and come be with him, to reject their old ways of life and learn his way of life, to set aside their plans and embrace his agenda. And this is, this is a harder ask. Jesus said in Matthew 7, enter, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leaves, leads to life and only a few find it. Will you find it? Will you find it with me? Will you find it together? It's tempting to pedal, to keep pedaling an artificially flavored Jesus product, seasoned with a flavored, with real bits of real Jesus in every crunchy bite, but which serves to allow us to hold on to our lives like a cheat code. Find them in a fashion without having to lose them at the end of the day. And serves to build our thing. Will you find that narrow way with me? In his classic book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer pointed out that costly is the call to follow Jesus. But there is an even greater cost. 
than the cost of discipleship. And friends, it's the cost of non-discipleship. It's that cost that we don't know we're paying. It's the abundant life which Jesus promised and we forfeit. It's that disparity filled in. It's a life where we're not exempt from problems, but where we take heart because the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. It's the cost of forfeiting victory in Jesus' name. It's the cost of peace that passes understanding, anchored in assurance that this world is not my home and that you can't kill me even if you do your worst because I have already died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. It's the cost of forfeiting that in this world I may have trouble, but Jesus has overcome the world and Jesus is making all things new, counting this guy starting in here and radiating outward. It's the cost of forfeiting being one who experiences the incomparable exhilaration of being an ambassador of Christ through whom he makes others new. Have you known it? Have you glimpsed it? I would say the cost of non-discipleship vastly outweighs the cost of following Jesus. And so I want to repent to you. And I want to invite you to repent as well. I want to repent to you for choosing to step away from the religious industrial complex. Only at times, perhaps without consciously meaning to, to step back into it. To make church attendance and participation the end when it's scarcely more than the beginning. I want to repent to you for fearing to ask you to pay that price which Jesus asks us to pay, to deny ourselves, to die to ourselves, and to follow him. Will you go with me there? Stand up with me if you would. It's time for us to go. We want to pray together. If you would just bow your head and close your eyes, just let's invite God's presence. Holy Spirit, here in this gathering, this sacred assembly, in this holy moment, would you come? Would you come and form our hearts to Jesus? Friends, remember the words of that old song and coming back to the heart of worship. It says, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. And I want to say to you and to, to Jesus in front of you, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made, discipleship. Wanting it to be convenient. Apologizing, in effect, for the strength of your ask. Friends, I want to invite you to repent. Have you gone along and participated like the emperor's new clothes? And I want to invite you to follow. Maybe some of us have understood Jesus' invitation to be a disciple in a way that was more formatted by our culture than our Savior. Maybe some of you have never understood the invitation at all. The great thing about Jesus is today starts now. And he says, today, if you hear my voice, would you soften your heart? Would you follow? And this is where it's highly unfortunate that I don't sing well, so I'm going to rely on you guys. 
Can we stop playing music for a sec? Just make it quiet. Okay, there's a song that I grew up hearing my parents sing that used those words, but it was a different tune. You probably know it, right? So could you find the key that works or whatever, the notes and the <laughs> melody? And just, can we just sing that, just our voices together as a prayer? I have decided to, to follow Jesus. Sing this if you need. I have decided sing it like a prayer to him. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Today, if you hear my voice, oh, don't harden your heart. Jesus, would you meet us in this tender place, this vulnerable place? Some of us, like me, are saying, man, I was wrong. Some of us are saying, wow, why didn't anyone tell me? Some of us are saying, I've stood on the outside and looked in. Taken you all up on the offer to not. And Lord, together as one, all of us who are willing, we say yes. We want to follow you. Show us how. Show us how to deny ourselves. Show us how to take up our cross daily. Show us how to walk with you. How to become like you. How to do what you did. Holy Spirit, help us. God, in us, would you form us anew. Father, would you receive glory in your church now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God? I'll tell you what. It's true. He's real. His promises are yes and amen. Will you follow him with us? Have an amazing week. Follow Jesus this week. We're going to talk about this over the next for Sundays in October, and this is going to form, shape the way we go forward as a church. So next week, Pastor Daniel is going to um, continue and develop what following Jesus looks like for us as individuals, and then we'll talk more about this together as we go this month. Go full of his life and peace, and let his love shine.